listening and welcome to On Point, where we talk to inspirational Fijians wherever they may be. I'm Ellen Whippy knight your host. Women can do anything, have a career, a family and juggle it well too. But what about women who have several careers? Our guest tonight is Suva lawyer Anna Tuikate, a former prosecutor who sits on several boards here and in the Pacific. Good evening, Anna, and how are you this evening? Looking glamorous, as is always usual. Thank you, Ellen, and good evening to you and good evening to your viewers. Look, it's been a great honour to have you here on the show today because you've been very, very busy. I know you've just got back from London uh, where you spent two years um, working and training as an international arbitration lawyer. You're an ex-ACS student yes. and also you were <laughs> ducks of the school too. Uh, yes. Yes. Now that is honestly a list of achievements that most people don't get in six lifetimes. <laughs> what made you decide to become a lawyer? Um, it's interesting you said that. Uh, my mom was the one that actually um, had uh, pushed for me to become a lawyer. I originally wanted to become a doctor to follow right. in her footsteps. Yes, of course. And of course she obviously noticed that I had the gift of the gab. Yes, without But I found doubt. out later in law school that it's not just the gift of the gab, it's actually knowledge with the gift yes. of the gab. Yes. Uh, yes, and so she inspired me to uh, become a lawyer. And then I took on law and my first job, apart from um, doing internship at Triple RT, where I worked with Imran Jalal and uh, Gina Hong Lee, uh, I joined the prosecution office and uh, I've never looked back since and I did not become a doctor because I feared the sight of blood uh, right. and the irony is when I joined the prosecution office my first case that I was thrown into was a murder trial so oh well there so was I had a lot to confront of gory, that yes so I had to confront blood that and anyway. details there yes so you went to London uh, to to well either whether it was learned or to practice um, under a very famous arbitration lawyer. What, what was that about? Yes, I, um, I studied under Gary Bourne, who's, right. uh, who's not only an inspiration around the world, uh, because he sits as an arbitrator, he also guest lectures around the world in different universities. Uh, but he, it, it was really good to be under his wings and to see how 80 lawyers really work uh, as lawyers, and it's always five o'clock somewhere around the world. Yes. It was also different for a Fijian who's used to the nine to five jobs and odd jobs during the weekends to actually go into an international law firm where you had 100 qualified lawyers from all over the world in 40 different offices. So for me, that was not only a leap of faith, but it was also a testing ground for me to see whether yes. the skills I've learned regionally was also applicable there. And yes, it, it was very good. So um, how, did, how did you get selected for this? Uh, I was headhunted by Gary himself, who was here for work. Uh, he That's is an amazing yes. achievement. So that law firm, uh, Wilma Hale, uh, we're doing uh, law reform uh, to say ADB has hired Gary as one of its... Um, ADB being yeah. the Asian Development, Development Bank? Bank as one of its consultants to try and bring law reform in the Pacific. Now, arbitration, international arbitration has been in for over three decades in other parts of the world, and Fiji only passed its legislation last year in December, gazetted it, mind you. Right. And in the Pacific, only three countries have passed it. It's Marshall Islands, Cook Islands, and Fiji. What do you need to pass... Uh, you know, the, the, the criteria. Yeah, no, you've got to be part of the New York Convention. You've got to right. see to it. The country has to. And then you've got to pass it on to national legislation. And then hopefully you will have our lawyers qualify uh, in terms of courses, in terms of experience, and then gain international recognition. Uh, because that itself is its own specialization. It's got its own set of networks. It's a different ball game altogether. Yeah. And how many other international arbitration lawyers do we have in Fiji? Uh, because Fiji only passed it last year, right. so the arena is quite new right. uh, for everybody. So there'd be Fiji. very few people well, at yes, this stage. Yes, but we also practice domestic arbitration. Right. Uh, but the rules of international arbitration is quite different. Right. And the landscape. And and so what are so, uh, some of the m more um, interesting cases that you have worked on? If you can talk about it. But, um, and if you can't, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just briefly. Yeah, so there, there's private... Like when are you called to, um, for your expertise? Uh, so, uh, you know, you can be an arbitrator itself or you can represent a party. Uh, and arbitration is actually an alternative dispute resolution. So it's an alternative solution instead of going to court. 
basically. Right. So in simple terms, yeah, for everybody to know. So normally sometimes, you know, you'll hear people say, I want to sue this one, I want to sue that one. They're referring it to the national courts. Whereas international arbitration, which is different from domestic, is um, a different type of dispute resolution. And all of us internationally, we're actually uh, accede to certain rules and regulations. Right. It sounds like a real task and a half. Very different, yeah. And is it difficult? a difficult area to get into? Uh, when it's new, absolutely. Uh, but they teach it at university. There's different institutions around the world. Mm. Australia and New Zealand have mm. it. Hong Kong, Singapore. Mm. Uh, so Fiji is going... I believe is on its way to setting up a centre, PNG as well. Right. And you're talking about it with a big smile on your face, when obviously you enjoy you know, what yes. you're doing in, yes. that, in that area. Yes. But again, we were talking about the fact that you're, um, y you have so many different things going on at the moment. You don't just do the one thing, at least yes. you know, ever since I've known you. Yes. And you also taught law yes. at the um, school in, yeah, at, at USP university. and the University of Fiji at one time. Uh, so teaching for me is um, it's also good uh, to have our students come and uh, have people that practice law come and also appear as guest lecturers in my course. So I teach advocacy, so I do the winter course or the summer course because it's quite brief for me and it suits my schedule. Right. And I try and have the students see lawyers and barristers and inspirational figures that they see in the courthouse or hear about in the news come and give them an idea of what they believe mm. makes a good advocate. Right. I do know, though, um, having worked with a number of young people and in, in Fiji Fashion Week who are actually studying law, yeah. that there is a, a general statement in there that there are a lot of graduates and yes. not enough work. Yes. What do we do about something like that? Um, it's interesting, depending on who you speak to, you'll have oh, different right. solutions. Okay. Um, but there's always... But the fact is, are there too many graduates? Uh, law is very broad. You know, every day, you, you know, you don't pay your parking meter, you can get fined. Uh, there are rules and regulations everywhere we go. Every day you wake up, your taxes, the fines that you have, applications that you follow, the age, the minimum age. So law is everywhere. Um, there's just other areas of law that's coming up. For example, this construction law that's right. also developing. So in then PG, what you're saying is there are jobs for lawyers, specializations, yes. uh, specializing um, in specific areas. Yes. And is, is it up to those graduates to find those areas or do they join a company who may put them into those areas to give them a job. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like the chicken and the egg, yeah? Which one comes mm. first? Uh, you know, the student might say, we only come out to what's at offer in the market. The lawyer, the, the established lawyer might say, we specialize in this, therefore we will only recruit people that are experienced. Uh, so there might be a gap, but it'll be interesting to see what the future holds for this profession in terms of having law as a base of a degree and furthering out into other options that there's Yes, because I think law is so important and, and also even if you didn't have enough mm. uh, work for law graduates, mm. uh, you get to get a job anywhere yeah. um, because you know everything has a legal entity yeah. to it and it's the law of the countries that yeah. you know and, and whatever organisation yeah. that you're working in that one must abide to Absolutely. Um, to be a good citizen. Absolutely. Let's talk about your fashion uh, experience and the yes. fashionista that you are when we yeah. get back. You're watching On Point with Ellen Whippy Knight and Anna Tukate, fashionista otherwise, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Welcome back to On Point with Ellen Whippy Knight and fashionista and lawyer and arbitrator and lots of other things as well, Anna Tukate. Anna, you have such an interesting life. Yes. You know, you're a very serious lawyer, a high achiever in that area. And then again, you're a fashionist. So when I very first met you was in 2008 yes. at the Hilton. And we both worked on the very first uh, Fiji Fashion Week. You were running around doing all the legals and we were running around trying to get the show organized. Yes. Um, but, you know, uh, besides that, uh, you have a very good fashion sense. What does fashion mean to you? Uh, fashion to me is a form of expression. It's yes. not only a statement. Uh, it's also uh, a way of, uh, a way of happiness. So when you are stressed out, you know, as you already said, I've got a very serious job. My job is to, my daytime job is to provide solutions to people. 
irrespective of what's going on in the background or what's happening in my other meetings during the day. So fashion for me is a way of putting color here and there or, or, or a bit of an escape yes. or a distraction, if you'd like yes. to call it. Well, yeah. it is rather distracting when you've got a really beautiful <laughs> dress like that on. And that also um, has a lot to do with some of the work that you do. Um, you know, part of your life is the beauty pageants in Fiji, Hi Miss Hibiscus, uh, Miss Fiji, South Pacific pageant. So tell us a little bit about that and where that's headed. Yes, so I'm on my second term uh, on the board for the Miss Pacific pageant. The headquarters for Miss Pacific Islands is in Samoa, in Apia, Samoa. This year we're on our way to PNG uh, right. in late November, early December. Uh, so this uh, the winner that wins Miss Fiji actually uh, goes on to Miss Pacific Islands. And the, this particular pageant, as you know, there's a lot of other pageants, international yes. pageants and regional pageants. This particular pageant hones in on, uh, on being patriotic and being cultural towards one society. Right. And how a woman that's uh, all-rounded is still connected to her home and her culture, how she will contribute positively back to her home country. Right. Yeah. Talking about beauty pageants, you know, they are the critics. Yes. And the critics say that, um, you know, the pageants make women look like show ponies. Yep. Show pieces. Do you think that pageants are important? Can we do without them or do we need them? I think historically in Fiji, we've always been about giving. Uh, and pageants is associated with giving back to society. Fundraising. Uh, yes, fundraising, uh, trying to build a city hall or trying to uh, advance, uh, you know, even some schools are coming up with pageants of trying to do right. community work. Um, the challenge for today's society is involving society uh, in the work of development and some see it as development, of, feet, development of, of, of its own community right uh, because you've got you know the last census about 70 percent of our population are less than 40. Yes. so for anyone that's hosting an event you host an event anyone that's trying to engage the community the challenge for you is what do you need to do to engage and i think beauty pageants uh, have young women or young men young uh, young people use that as a platform to not only voice their concerns or opinions, but using it as a platform to draw other young people uh, so that they can be part of a bigger and larger community. Of course, there's critics. There's critics of, um, you know, of girls uh, being made to look in a different light. Mm. But most of these women that actually are on it are embracing the empowerment side of it. And it's very, you know, even as a lawyer, when you go to court, you know, as a barrister, you can get nervous and public speaking, it's a, it's a different uh, arena altogether. And so this, these young people are actually using this platform, speaking in public, drawing attention, uh, because the pageant community itself, anywhere you look around the world, they've got its own following. It's got its own following. Yes. And there's no doubt about that. So when you take on that platform, just like Fashion Week, it's got its own following around the world, you've also engaged the audience that follow that. Right. Yeah. I do want to ask a question, though, because I was a judge on Miss High Business yes, one yes, year. Yes, yes, absolutely. Alan. And, I, and I think, uh, you know, I looked at the questions that were being yes, asked yes. of the Queen. Yes. And, and I looked at who the actual people, the contestants were and their background. And I felt that some of the questions were definitely too difficult mm. for the capacity or the intellectual capacity of this, the um, contestants because most of them were not university graduates. Mm. Mm. A lot of them are secretaries, not saying the secretaries yep, um, are not intelligent. But, uh, you know, there was a question there one time of uh, why did the um, International Monetary Fund uh, not give this $2 million towards yep. Fiji for yep. a particular course? And, yep. and the candidate was actually a, um, a sales assistant. Yep. Yep. You know, so how do you, in an, I know it's very difficult, but to go across the board and try and level the mm. question so that you're not catching them out. Because mm. I felt that... Uh, the audience we had such a great time yep. laughing mm. at the contestants mm. when they can't answer the question because they don't understand it yes. because they're not educated to that level. Yes. So your question is in twofold. I think uh, as an audience to support young people, we as Fijians and Pacific Islands, we need to develop uh, the virtue of empathy. 
Uh, also, we can't, you know, I understand, but young people are really resilient. They've been mm. exposed to technology since the age when they were four months, five months years old. And sometimes, if you're going to represent our country or represent the city, we have to portray the best. Yes. And it's funny because, you know, some, you know, there's a saying is that, you know, you don't know how strong you are until being strong is no choice. Yes, And exactly. it brings, yes, yeah, so it's also a competition. Uh, yes. and, and it brings out the best out of these yes. people. Um, and some of the answers actually surprises us because we sometimes fit people in a box as to profession or their trade. But when they actually talk, you can see a holistic mm. approach. Well, I guess, you know, I suppose it's a good thing that you challenge them. Yes. Um, I, I suppose what I meant was that, you know, is... Is uh, it fair they, on them? Yes, That's what is you're it saying. fair yes. on them? And, yes. you know, yes. then when they don't answer yes. properly, yes. Um, everybody laughs. Yes. But look, you know, you've done a lot of work for mm -hmm. the women in Fiji and for children. And for that, you were ordered and um, you were given the middle, the um, medal of the Order of Fiji in yes. 2017. Yes, yes. Did you expect that? Uh, no, uh, I was nominated by a group of young people uh, because I, I've done volunteer work for as long as I can remember. Uh, when I was a prosecutor, I joined, um, you know, various NGOs. I was doing hibiscus as well. I was sitting on the board for rugby league. And for oh. that, yeah, so for five years, I vetted contracts. Uh, I appeared, you know, for any uh, women that needed a DVRO when the Domestic Violence Act came yes. out. I appeared there for free, even when I joined private sector. So, yeah, I, I do a lot of work, but to get recognition for, for that it. specific work for young people and women, it was an honor. And, uh, yeah, even if I didn't get it, I think I'd still be doing what, I, what I'm currently doing now. And who actually awards that medal? Uh, the... I think it's a committee, but uh, I was given the medal by the president of Fiji. Right. Yeah. So uh, there's a committee, I think, and the late Dixon Sito, I think, was also part of that uh, committee. Right. That and vet. Having, getting a medal like that, how does that affect uh, your your uh, reputation, mm -hmm. um, your work? Mm -hmm. I I haven't won that medal after that uh, that occasion. I haven't right. also put it in. Is it framed CV. on your yeah, living it's, it's room in the cabinet. Yes, 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 yes. And I should, I should be talking about it more, but I haven't um, well, thought I just about want to it. Well, I'll say that. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Because you, you deserve <laughs> it, and I think it's an honour to be recognised yeah. by your country for the work yes. that, uh, that yes. you've done with women and children. You're talking with Ellen Whippy Knight and Anna Tuikate. You're on point, and we'll be right back to you. Welcome back to On Point with Ellen Whippy Knight and Anna Tuikate, an amazing person with so many achievements. Anna, another of your titles, amongst all the other ones, is that you're the only Fijian woman World Rugby Judicial Officer. I mean, what is that title? The only thing I recognize in that is the word rugby. Yes. And I'm not sure how you're you're associated are you playing rugby or you you know in pretty dresses yeah. uh, you know i know that you're married to james mollenbu yes uh, who's a world ex world rugby referee rugby union uh, it's amazing that also that when you got your medal um, james also got yes. the same medal the order of fiji in the same year, but yes. both of you did not know that yes. either of you yes. had been awarded yes, that. Yes, had been nominated, yes. So um, back to your role and, and what that means. Yes, so I, I was volunteering for Fiji Rugby Union for about four years. And in, in doing this work, in, in trying to assist with broadening the contract, the arena, the commercial aspect of Fiji Rugby and the contribution back to Fiji, I realized that uh, we needed to be involved in the international arena, the regional. And as a lawyer, I, I got into training to be a judicial officer. What does so a for judicial those, officer yes, do? Yes, so those, for those of you viewers that don't know, so we, whenever you, ha you see a player on the field with a red card, so they actually... To be, they actually have to go to a hearing before sanctions is passed out. So after, the hearing when they when they after they've been after the game after the game yes right. so they can have a red card during the game or during uh, the off, uh, so the citing commissioner can actually cite the player on the field. So a judicial officer sits and hears um, from both sides, including the player himself and then or herself, and then issues out the sanction. And so I decide what the sanction is from the. 
So do you do that for um, locally or internationally? Regionally and internationally. And so that I'll, means you need to be at the actual game. Yes, uh, yes, you need to be at the actual game, the venue, because you know with sevens it's a very short window period. Uh, and oh, is it 15s, only in sevens? Yeah, and fifteen. So it depends. Right. Yeah. Okay, and and uh, if anybody wanted to be that, is it an easy role to achieve? Uh, yeah, do you have to sit well, an well, exam? Well, rugby has its own. Yeah, well, rugby has its own criteria. Uh, we've got our original Oceanic, uh, the Pacific comes under the Oceanic uh, Foru, which is what, what we call them, the Oceanic Rugby Union, and the, criteria, the application goes there, and then they vet, and then you actually have to have a license, you actually have to sit an assessment. So, so and then after a, that, then if you graduate, then you become a judicial right. officer. Yeah. And being a lawyer, did that, did that help? Oh you yeah, know, absolutely. In your, um, yeah, with career? with interpretation, uh, the, not only lawyers are judicial officers. You've also got ex players that are judicial officers right. or coaches, right. uh, because one of the argument that moved from one panel to three panel is that you know you need to get the full aspect before you give a sanction out. Uh, right. You know whether to ground this person or to have this person out in two games or three games. Right, and that uh, person can get a red card even though. They've um, also after the referee has because now you've got those ATRs. Yeah, those. Uh, yep, the, the sighting commissioners. Yep. Yes, and and I heard that um, uh, the Egyptian player that's playing f football on the international, um, you know, uh, scene now, he said he didn't like ATRs basically because it takes the fun out of the game. Yeah, well, you know, it's technology, it's times, yes. and people, the more specific you are, people want definites now, you know, no longer the grey area. And, because yeah. without ATRs, uh, you know, some people may not never been penalised, yep. and then some people may have been penalised because it wasn't an ATR. And also people want things in real time, in real motion. Right. So that's the challenge of right. actually playing alongside technology and the crowd expectation. Yes. Because people also pay What was games. it like being married to a, uh, a rugby referee who traveled the world constantly. Was it always about rugby in your house? Uh, not really, because I have my own life. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course. I, I was involved in other things, and I think uh, being involved as a judicial officer, being up to date with the latest uh, with the latest law changes or any amendments, it really brought us together because he's a referee. So mm -hmm. they interpret the game on the field in real time. Yeah. I do it after the fact. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, yeah, and sometimes we debate and he's very conservative in his outlook. Uh, he's pro-referee, so, right. um, you know, so we have those type of debates and then we draw the, I have to draw the line, yeah. and so those other things. Is there a role for women in rugby? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, times are changing. We're not the only ones that have to carry the kids to the rugby field, to sort out the picnic baskets or gather the troops to support. And wash the clothes And afterwards. wash the clothes after and the boots yes. and don't forget to hang and uh, yes. mend all the clothes and things like that. I think it's also changing the landscape because girls and women are also playing rugby. That's uh, as correct. well, yes. So in the developing countries, that is one thing that we need to embrace. Surely there's stigmas involved uh, with involvement in the game, but on the administrative level, women are really needed to make the tough decision when it comes to finance for any sport, sporting but federation. why women in particular? I do know that I asked the question mm. um, that, I, I, you know, is there room for women in rugby? Mm. Um, but you're alluding to the fact that the administration side... Yeah, the boards... It, uh, uh, that's not yep. the only part of rugby for women, yep. though, is it? Yeah. So, you know, there's boards, there's also subcommittees that we can be involved in, there's marketing aspects mm. of the game, there's also fundraising. I mean, the mothers are doing the fundraisers anyway. Yes. You might as yes. well make the decision on the bigger... Yes. Are you involved with the Fiji Rugby Women's uh, Association no, I'm, I'm with No, I'm with the Fiji Sports Commission. So we look after more than about 60 sports in the country. Right. So, yeah, so my service is on the national bodies. But I do avail myself for all the other NSOs of the federations that are involved, whether they be in athletics rugby league yes. or other sports that are available. Yes. Well, look, you know, you've done, you've done a lot in your young life and you're really still considered a newly married because yes. it's only been a year yes, or so yes, sort yes. of thing. So the next question has to be, obviously, when will you have time for a family? Oh, the to picnic. start a family? Yes. Uh, you know, like any working mother, we'll just roll along and then happen when it happens but also it's just another um i am actually looking forward to it we're looking forward to it because it's another aspect of career another aspect of life in a different yes. season 
I reckon. Yes, yes. And will that young little um, mite, whether it be a girl or boy, be running around with the rugby jersey You just any never time? know. I mean, we're all Fijians and we're all Pacific Islanders. Yes. Rugby's in the blood and service is in our blood. So Indeed. let's see. So Anna, where to from here? Um, I'm really excited about the changes that the legal landscape that Fiji is making in terms of trying to be the center of you know, Pacific arbitration or international arbitration in our region. I'm also excited about the Singapore Convention that was just signed on mediation yes. and trying to make uh, Fiji the place where business should be, not the way the world should be in the tourism right. aspect, but also seeing it in terms of private sector development. So I actually look forward to yeah, the young and up and comings and uh, seeing them try and change and shape our landscape to be yes. in a different uh, place where it is now. And is there room for politics in your life? Yes, I, I think, I mean, there ought to be sooner or later, uh, yeah. but not now. Um, I think my contribution is on a policy level. Right. It's also uh, influential on leaving what I want mm. to see get done. So I just think I, before I, I always, advise, I need to leave it first. Yes, I always ask that question of women yes. that we've interviewed on this show because I'm very interested in having more women yes. on board, knowing that we're great multitaskers, yes, yes, yes. you know, great analytic, yes. an, analytical um, people. And, and I think the fact that, um, you know, the mother, yes. the mother in us yes. um, would make us, makes us very good uh, politicians. Yes. But look, congratulations. Thank you. You've done so much in your life, as I said earlier. I know there's a heck of a lot more to go that you're going to um, achieve. And uh, we do look forward to the little pitter patter of uh, <laughs> feet very soon. So thanks a lot, Arnon. We'll talk with you again Absolutely. very soon. And you've been watching Anna Tukate and Ellen Whippy Knight on point. We'll see you again at the same time next Monday at 8 p.m.